and welcome back to another episode of Crew Talk. Um, so I hope you're having a wonderful week getting ready for the holiday weekend. We have a very cool topic tonight. We are talking about coloring and this is the topic I don't know a whole lot about. So I am very, very excited to hear from our panel of experts. I have my list of questions here. And as always, if you have any questions, um, you can just type them into our question and answer box. Um, I'm talking to you tonight into my phone because I couldn't get the computer working. So if I look uh, like I'm looking all over the place, that's why. But I'm going to go ahead and jump right into it uh, tonight. So hello to my panel of experts. Thank you so much for being here with me this evening. <laughs> Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Of course. Hello. Yes. <laughs> Don't jump on each other when we all say hello. 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 <laughs> good. It's good to have you guys here. And I'm excited to learn all about coloring. The only coloring I know is coloring in a coloring book. So this will be new. Um, so good. let's just start off by um, asking, what is the difference between color grading and color correcting? And how is each used differently? Mm. And so anyone can be very polite. Question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. Okay. Yeah, I'll, ju I'll jump in. Let's let's pound the the normal there theory. You go, Kevin. And I think what could be fun is if we all have different uh, different definitions. So generally, color correction and color grading, people mishmash them a lot and start you know think it's the same thing or just one very long phrase. But color grading overall is talking about what is the look, the mood, sort of the final adjust or the adjustment of the the color and the tone to really create the mood of the story. Whereas color correction, I think of as more, you know, all the building blocks underneath it that allow that to happen, that, that create the polish, that create everything. So generally with color correction, you'll have, um, you need to be able to match clips. You know, when you shoot something, most often you have clips from different angles, from different cameras, and you need to be able to match them so that it looks like one seamless piece of work. And then there are also a lot more minute corrections that you go into. So you're changing the, the light, you're changing the hues and saturations, and you know, you're trying to get everything to look just right. But then there are also a lot of other elements to that, uh, where that I think a lot of people overlook. Like if I were to break down my work and you guys, I'm sure, depending on what genres you're working in have totally different things, but I feel like 90% of my work is probably color correction which is like fixing noisy footage or color casts that weren't, that got messed up when they're shooting, um, right down to like fixing cosmetic enhancements. Like your subject on the cameras, you know, missed the makeup somewhere or is looking really, um, you know, has a pimple or something. Those, you can go from as broad as how it's lit right down to little corrections like that. And then the color grading is what you do on top of that to, to give the overall look and mood on top of the, uh, the correct, the fixed items there, yeah. Right. Great definition. Yeah, most of my work is definitely um, I, I would I would classify as uh, color correction as well. You know, getting everything to match and look seamless and you know flow together um, as a cohesive scene, um, and then like you said, building upon that to uh, you know add the color grading on top of that. Uh, but yeah, ninety percent of my work is definitely color correction as well, balancing. You know, that's yeah, and as an example of that, we had a we had a shot where we had a we had a pickup, and it was a it was for a um, it was for an iPad uh, piece, and basically the the uh, wardrobe got the wrong jeans, <laughs> and so we had to cut this jean shot in <clears throat> to a shot that had a different set of jeans, very similar in pattern, so it kind of worked, but the color was off, and so we had to go in roto the jeans out. I had to go in roto the jeans out. And then shift that color so that when they cut back and forth, it didn't look like the guy magically changed his jeans you know, within three <laughs> seconds. And so that's an example of, of how you can do like that's a color correction, you know, uh, which isn't always so obvious, but it also really empowers uh, the creatives to add stuff, take things away, change things, uh, reduce or add color into a scene, uh, even change shirt colors, those type of things, eye colors, that type of thing. So that's more of a correction versus like, like Kevin had said, an overall tone or mood change. Cool, those are great definitions. Thank you guys. So why is high dynamic range HDR color grading gaining so much popularity? I'll jump on this one. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, one of the big things is that you're working in a massive 
color range and a massive um, dynamic range, meaning the brightness levels, which kind of represent what you can see outside in some ways, um, or even in this dark room or in the rooms that you guys are in, the lights behind you are extremely, extremely bright. Um, probably three or 4,000 nits or candelas, you know, how bright something is in particular. Um, so to, to recreate even these darker environments, you need two, three or 4,000 nits just to re recreate the reflections on my skin or, or that light right there over my shoulder. Um, and it provides this depth um, that you really don't see um, in standard dynamic range uh, content. So why it's taken off is that creatives love to tell stories and with more color, with more dynamic range, you're able to tell um, a story in such a way that really brings the person in, really draws them in, creates new reactions. Um, and so I think that's one of the big reasons why, uh, plus the TVs today. I mean, look at the TVs, they're, they're really bright. Right. Um, and they're really dark at the same time. You know, you've got this OLED technology out there and our SDRs, our standard dynamic range content was just being stretched into those. We would look at our colorists sitting there in, in the studios and we'd be grading at hundred nits and then they'd go to a TV and it's six times bright, you know, so that it didn't look like what we, what we saw in the, in the studio and what got approved. And so high dynamic range allows you to um, manage that color as well, manage that brightness. So if you wanted to be at 200 nits, you can send it out at 200 nits and it'll look like 200 nits when it gets home. Um, so there's a lot of other things other than just being bright and wide color. Um, it's actually a way of managing an image all the way through a pipeline so that what, what we sit and toil over day and hours at a time to try to get right is actually seen by the, by the consumer uh, sitting there and, and uh, getting a value out of that. Nice. Does anybody else want to uh, jump in that one? Yeah, I mean, I've not done any dynam high dynamic range stuff uh, before, so I'm I'm fascinated to hear about it from Shane. Yeah. Nice. Agreed. Can you talk well, no, a little bit about um, any specialized equipment that you have to use doing HDR work? Right. So, um, so to distribution do, wise, how you oh, right some, and distribution. Yeah. Yeah, so um, basically, um, depending on what platform you're working, if you're working in DaVinci Resolve, you can, if you have DaVinci Resolve, you can do HDR uh, content without any license or anything else. You can work in um, that format. It's basically HDR is an ecosystem and it's a workflow that basically says you work in a PQ space, which is perceptual content, it replaces gamma. And you need a monitor, so something like that monitor right there, that's the Flanders XM310. There's a lot of other uh, monitors on the market that, that display in PQ space um, and have a, a certain you know, brightness level. It goes up to, this one goes to 3000 nits, but if you got 600 or 1000 nits, um, you'll be able to see in HDR as long as that's showing in PQ. So you need a monitor, you need a system, your regular system will probably already do it. So your laptop, I can do HDR on my laptop, um, but you'll be able to be able to display those images on a PQ monitor. Um, and that's really all you need to do grading on HDR. Um, now on the distribution side, that gets a little more complicated, but that's something that we don't get involved with, <laughs> right, as colorists. Um, there's a lot of other stuff we can talk about, but you can do it pretty quickly. And they're getting a lot more technology into it. So you're gonna be able to see HDR images on TVs. We can already you know, tunnel into like LG TVs and other, other TVs that'll recognize HDR signals. Uh, so you can review on those TVs, and uh, though it's not recommended, you could probably even do a grading uh, on those monitors at some point in the future as they get better and better. But again, that's that's not a recommended uh, workflow. You always want to recommend going on a on a mastering monitor, but um, you can always review. You know, clients want to see it, and <laughs> I want to see it this you know on this TV out and big in front of you, and you know you let them. <laughs> they're paying the bills so right <laughs> wonderful so what software do you use and what other useful tools and hardware do you recommend all right i think you just touched on some of it shane with the uh and and we could actually use your backdrop as uh as an example of like well here is the control surface <laughs> but you don't necessarily need it but if you're doing a lot of coloring it helps to have something like that to move quicker um but in terms of the software i'm I'm wagering we all use the same thing, but maybe not. Um, DaVinci Resolve is sort of the, mm. the industry standard. And then you need a beefed out system to be able to handle those files real time. So if you have a client working with you, there's no lag whatsoever. Or if you're just rendering or handling, you know, now we're seeing you know, 8K, 6K footage, like cinema camera footage, you need to be able to handle so many 
different yeah. elements. And so yeah. um, if you are actually just professional colorist, you just need the most beefed out computer ever. And <clears> then, <throat> you know, DaVinci Resolve is the software and then you need a calibrated color monitor, especially if you're doing work that's gonna be projected. And cinema wise, you know, if you're doing something on a phone, I still think it's it's valuable, but then you get into a lot of discrepancies and you need to test on million different monitors and you can never really be sure where HDR may come in more helpful, where you can be Absolutely. more consistent. Mm -hmm. um, but those are the most essential, crazy computer, calibrated monitor, hardware calibrated. So it's not just something like, you know, consumer grade <laughs> software thing that can get messy. Um, yeah. And then one of the big benefits when you work with the colorist is if they have a control panel, I actually have the exact same one. <laughs> it's like that perfect middle point where you just, you can start to really fly. And so as opposed yeah. to, um, if you have an editor trying to do some corrections, a colorist will be able to fly through that because you can be moving multiple hands and doing a lot of different corrections all at the same time, as opposed to like mouse click, menu change, mouse click. Yeah. Um, slide, slide yeah. round. <laughs> right. Slide, slide round, not the slide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but it's really the software, uh, the hardware itself isn't necessarily complicated. You just need some firepower depending on what your setup is. You know, but some companies just have smaller cameras and can benefit from, you know, don't need something crazy. It depends if you're doing in-house, if you're a professional colorist, if you're in a post house, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be based on those needs. And where you are in the pipeline. I mean, if you're on the front end yeah. and you're doing DI work and um, sometimes you don't need to have heavy lifting, you can work in proxy, you can work in, in these lighter formats or, you know, work in the, even the red raws and those type of things that give you a ability to just go down to eight bit and, and be able to, you know, cruise through on a laptop you know, and actually get some good quality imagery there, even though it may not be real time, you may not need real time, depending on where you are in that pipeline. Um, yeah. Did anyone else wanna jump? I thought I heard someone else starting to talk there. Um, it might so, have been Blake. I, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so how, how did you all get started in your profession? Like how does, how does one get started? So I started out um, as an editor in post-production um, and was an editor for uh, a long time, still am an editor. Um, and as, as um, color correction and color grading tools became more widely available, um, I started incorporating it into, into my repertoire, my services, um, and uh, just took it upon myself really to start, you know, learning as much as I can about it. And um, you know, there's tons of online resources that um, folks can folks can use to to learn more. Um, uh, and so, as as um, as my skills progressed, uh, to touch back on what Kevin was saying, you know, I I, I picked up a uh, a control surface, um, and and you know, uh, my work became easier um, after after I picked up the control surface for sure. Um, but yeah, just uh, start started out as an editor and gradually uh, start incorporating more color work into into my services. What are some of those online references that you mentioned? Oh, I mean, you know, there's you Google uh, you yeah. if you YouTube color grading uh, tutorials. There's a billion of them, um, but there's you know there's some industry. Um, industry groups um like mixinglight.com is a good one um, robbie's awesome <laughs> yeah uh you know it's it's a um community of of professional colorists who um are all very welcoming and um very helpful and um uh they have great tutorials on on their website and a uh, a good uh, thriving community that's great. And a nice email newsletter that comes yes. every yeah. Sunday morning. My wife's every always like, Sunday. what are you reading on a yeah. Sunday? <laughs> <laughs> Same yeah. thing. Geek. Same here. Yeah. 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 Kevin, how did you get started, man? Uh, I'd be curious yeah, how you got I have started. A, you know, we're so lucky in terms of just how a lot of this software and hardware has become just available so much more yeah. recently. Um, so I actually start off as an actor and I did that for <laughs> 10 years, right? As a regional theater actor who then started yeah. making films and I was, I shipped into directing and I was sitting in on my first color session and I just remember looking at what he was doing and I was like, yeah. that is cool. <laughs> so then for yeah. the, the next yeah. six, seven films that I made, I was like, well, I'm, you know, <laughs> rough in the old budget. I think I can try to do it myself, you know, coming from editing to, I sort of did the whole should you know the thing you do when you have no money and right. 
And then I started getting better and better and just so much more interested in it. So same thing as Evan in terms of online resources, just going crazy there. And then I started meeting with um, digitally some other colors sort of trading trips and started working, you know, as a freelancer in different agencies. And so I cross paths and just sort of organically grew the experience. And then people started asking me when they saw my work to color their films and then transition into the ad world, you know, how, how yeah. it goes. You all sort of- move Word of mouth yes. networking. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But you start as, starting as an actor, then a director, then a <laughs> <laughs> colorist. I mean, but it, and that's been, that's been the focus uh, primarily since, but it all started with just seeing what a colorist could do in the moment and just being like that. You know that I need more of that in my life. I got my start as a DJ. I got my start as a DJ. Yeah, I got my start as a DJ when I was thirteen to nineteen years old. Uh, I was like mixing and scratching with five turntables, a buddy, and really heavily into the the, the hip hop, and you know, just just cutting and creating new music, creating my own songs. And then I was like, I really want to do this with video. You know, like I really want to. I got I can mix nice. music, but now I want to mix video, and so. You know, this was, you know, back in the day, we'll say it that way. Um, and uh, I said, at some point, I'm going to get in this industry. I really want to do this. And finally, I got a break by uh, managing a sound and uh, post house. Uh, I started, I came in from the management side and uh, started working in there and started doing editorial and that kind of thing. And finally became, you know, I just was like, okay, forget this producing stuff. I'm going to be an editor and just started collecting plugins and plugins final cut pro had you know thousands <laughs> of plugins and i just became the plugin uh, i'll just say i i had probably nearly every plugin i could find buying them <laughs> pay, i mean everything and i was just doing stuff to footage that you i mean that just isn't normally done in final cut pro at the time and uh and finally i i got introduced to a colorist friend of mine uh, gary coates out here in san francisco and uh, we worked on an Apple project and and he had built out this structure in Final Cut for, you know, your primary room, your secondaries and all this kind of stuff in Final Cut. Like he built this thing all out with all these plugins and stuff. And and I'm like, that's what I do. I'm like, I did, but I don't name him the same thing. And I was like, you know, I do this. And he's like, we, I started showing him back and forth. And he's like, you're coloring, man. And I'm like, <laughs> really? And I was like, that's a job, you know, like I was just a guy who fixed the footage when I was editing and that's kind of what I did was fix the footage when I edited. So I got a lot more jobs. And finally, when I found out that you can get paid for doing just this part, <laughs> um, by that time, Apple just bought final touch, which I had been playing with, um, for a couple years. Um, and, uh, <laughs> I love the doggy. <laughs> um, and so I finally just said, okay. And I talked to a couple of my, my, uh, my clients. I said, Hey, would you, like do you guys go to colorists and they're like yeah we, we always take it out it's like well i can do that for you and it just my next year it doubled my my work <laughs> just by offering coloring so i didn't come up in the studio system either so i, I love hearing these stories how people actually get a start and why so. that's awesome so how has COVID affected your work um <laughs> I don't have to bring I, I the actually, mood down. I actually <laughs> like it. I, I actually like it to be honest with you because I, I lose a commute. <laughs> I already yeah. have a home studio. Work from it's home. A, yeah. yeah, I already have a home studio, and my commute's about I don't know twelve feet. So uh, it's it's actually quite nice. Uh, I save time. Um, the only and actually it's been really good for me because I've I've actually talked to my boss a whole lot more, interacting with them a lot more because he's down in Burbank. Um, just working, interacting uh, with people at a distance. It, it's, whereas before you want to kind of, I just, I used to want to do more distance work. Uh, now I kind of have to. And, and so that was actually an opportunity. So I, I kind of like the fact that I can just jump in and I've, I've already got a good monitor. I've got good system. You can't see it, but I got a couple, you know, monster boxes over there, a super micro and a Z8 sitting right there. Um, and so they're, they, I don't know. I, I, I kind of like working at home because I get to take a break and actually go get, you know, lunch from my kitchen <laughs> rather yeah. than uh, rather than having to uh, to go out and pay for lunch and, you know, waste 40 minutes uh, each way for driving. But I do miss the coffee breaks with people. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> Has it affected yeah. the amount of work or do you think it will moving forward, like how things are done? It affected the amount of work for me, for sure. I mean, mm -hmm. once production dropped off, uh, post-production dropped off for me. 
Absolutely. Um, yeah. But it, it's picked back up um, in the last in the last uh, six or eight weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, great. More work coming in. Um, but I mean, I, I'm freelance, so I work from home most of the time anyways. Um, I, I have a, a beefy computer system and a, a, you know, Flanders monitor as well. Um, so, you know, I, I can do what I need to do from home. Totally. Yeah. And there's something, it's been an interesting time as well in that, in the way, you know, I'm a freelancer as well. And so the way I frame color or help agencies I'm working with frame color to their clients, um, mm-hmm. especially with the more commercial and ad-based work that it needs to become more in term, more talk about strategy than ne- necessarily aesthetics. And I found that in the past couple months, as things get tight financially, that something that I've always tried to get my clients excited about is like, okay, well, it's, it's the story and it's the strategy. Like this has subconscious impact on what people watch and, and how they feel when they're watching it. And that's become more of the dialogue as opposed to that looks great uh, or that doesn't because that looks great can get the chopping block really, you know, mm. more easily depending on what level of clients work and what the projects are. Um, and something that might be a little more unconventional is I've, I've also started working with some of my clients who have editors in house and actually just working to, train them up on some of the more regular corrections they do. So there's actually been a weird shift towards slight consulting work a bit just to help in-house teams who would normally be like, oh yeah, here, we'll, you know, please do this project for us. But now it's like, I want to empower them a bit more to be able to do some of it themselves and then have mm-hmm. me on to help with that. Now, obviously you can't teach what a colorist does in any short time because like even with what we're talking about with, oh, you just look at some YouTube tutorials the actual how to do isn't it, it's the workflow, it's the process, how you put the pieces together, knowing what to use in the first place. But I'm finding with some of my clients where I could just be a bit helpful in this interim if their budgets have been slashed or what have you to be like, okay, well, this is the kind of project you normally do. You have an interview set up, well, here are, you know, here's a workflow you can do, or here's a node structure, here are things that you can do just to enhance that for the interim. And then in the meantime, I'm here for a bigger project if you need it. So it's been, it's been fun sort of, seeing what people need and, and adapting as well, instead of just going to the traditional model that I'm accustomed to. Sure, absolutely. So why why would I need a colorist? Like why couldn't an editor do what I would need them to do? Who wants it? Oh. I know, we're like, ooh, <laughs> I can go fishing on this one. We should, we should like totally like Rochambeau for it. That'd be kind of nice. Right. <laughs> Well, I, I don't know. I think I think an editor can do it to some extent. I mean, I'm an editor, and I also do um, color grading. But you know, you do you do need specific um, um, skills and an eye for it. Um, you know, you don't want to just hand it off to anyone to to um, you know to work through the whole process. Uh, you know, you want to have someone who has an eye for it. Um, uh yeah <laughs> i don't know what else to add to that other than um other than that but uh, yeah i think an editor can do it but you need you need an eye yeah the eye for sure and then also some practical considerations like just speed um and the sure. level of depth that you can do like an editor they're dealing with who knows the producer or 50 other people that are all given input saying oh do this this, this. and whereas the colors can just focus on what they're doing, but also just technical controls like inside most editing software, unless they're editing within DaVinci naturally, but I find that tools are much less intuitive and we just know, again, those those workflows to, to do. So an editor can train in those, um, but it's just, they may not op- be optimized for that for that process, for that system. And, and also, I mean, I'm sure you guys agree, like there's just a, a thought process as a colorist, when you're looking at something that by being able to focus on that exclusively, you can just hone it in that much better. There are fewer considerations you're, you're bouncing around if that makes sense. But and also just quantity of doing it. You just get better at it if you're not <laughs> worrying right. about what clip a client wants versus doesn't. Instead, you're like, I'm just going to make what you have look really good. And <laughs> it's just a different focus over time. Yeah, I don't know, Shane, you have anything of work. Cool? Yeah, yeah, like a body of work. You know, as you start to get a body of work and you start to, I mean, I, I'm, an, I'm an editor as well. I'm a finishing editor. 
but when I'm, I try to separate those two things uh, really and try to pull them apart and, and really put two different hats on um, because I, look, I have a whole different set of considerations when I'm editing versus when I'm coloring. Uh, and sometimes it's hard to pull them apart, but if you're just focusing on one or the other, um, you really do look at it like Evan said, or Kevin said, uh, see my first mistake. Ah, <laughs> Kevin, you're waiting for it. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you look at it in a different light. Um, you know, for example, you you really focus on context. I mean, in in coloring, you try to bring the context of a moment in and and really look at okay, how can I best tell this moment? Um, not using all the other, you know, you look at where it comes from, you look at where it, you know what it is, and then where it goes, like an editor does. But you also try to fill in the context, and you understand the human visual system. You understand how people are going to react. You understand what people are, um, how they're affected, the moods they're affected by, and what the color or what the lack of color does to an image. And, and when you can get into those advanced kind of techniques or understandings, you really do bring a lot to the to the table when you talk about taking a story from, you know, an impact of say here to an impact of up here. Uh, and there is a big difference. And that's why you want to maintain that and be able to manage that through the pipeline as well Is you want that impact because you spend a lot of time trying to get that impact on the on the user. You're just crafting reactions. That's what yeah, you're doing. That's a good way to put it. So how can a colorist cut overall production cost as to as opposed to being an additional cost? I'll, I'll don't show up. On. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll jump on that just because I'm always a Philly. Like, I know. Yeah. Like, um, yeah. Just a lot of people come, at least I arrived at color from, okay, I was a director and a cinematographer who then got a lot more cinematography work because I got really good at coloring and then shifted over to color. You know, like, but there was that all in one nature for a while. And in doing that, you, and then when you start working with bigger teams, you see, okay, well in color, I can do, you know, I can reshape light. I can fix issues and you always want to get it right in camera. I'm not advocating that you don't, but if you really know what you can do in color and you know, you're gonna have a colorist on board, you might not need as big a crew. You might not need as much, you know, as a gaffer or a grip, like you may not need as many uh, budget for lights. You may not need as high end camera because you just don't. And a lot of production companies, I feel like they want to appear professional and sort of pad the budget sometimes. Um, a lot don't, a lot are, most are really scraping by, but it does happen on occasion mm -hmm. um, because that's traditionally how it's done, right? And, and that's also what clients expect a lot of the times. And so if you have a colorist on board and you they're familiar with that workflow and the producer knows how they, it can be used, quite often you can shrink the size of a crew to some extent, you can move faster, you can, um, build that in, build the colors in during pre-production and just change expectations. So I found that at least in the projects that I've been in charge of in the past, by knowing that color was going to be a big part of it, the upfront production cost could really be trimmed down a lot. But that takes a producer who understands what the what the capabilities are as well. So that's a that's a big if, right? So that's, that's right. Big. That's I, a great totally explanation. Agree. Yeah, yeah. That, that makes sense. Yeah, I, Kevin, I'm I just getting ready to go on a production myself in, in, a, in probably about a month here. I was called in and they, I'm actually going to be inside a theater correcting live on, <clears throat> on the screen while they're shooting, you know, people talking in the theater from behind to make sure that that it's that it's clear. So in a sense, we're I'm there to help, you know, relight the scene in such a way to actually get the images that are up on the wall. Um, whereas they may have to go in and do a bunch of measurements, a bunch, you know, a lot more people on set and a lot more time, a lot more lights and have a lot more flexibility where I'm going to go in there with my laptop, you know, plug directly into the projector and, and be able to control that light that's happening on screen behind them. Uh, and that will save them time. That will save them money over and eventually, even though they're adding me for three days, um, ultimately it will pull down that overall cost for them. Is that easier or harder to do it like live while it's happening versus in post? Oh, it's a totally different animal. I mean, this is more of a specialty but, yeah. case. It's really a specialty case. It's because they're actually going to be shooting what's being seen on screen, right? And okay, what's yeah. being seen on screen is actually being shot like the day before, okay. <laughs> right? So um, it's going to be a, an interactive situation where they would have to do a lot more um, 
yeah, they'd have to do a whole lot more on the production side in order to achieve what I can help them achieve by being on set and being able to look at that. Uh, those images and adjust those images live. It, it's usually, a, it's a rare use case, but it is a case mm -hmm. where we're going to save them money or I'm going to save them money just by being on set for three days. That's pretty yeah. cool. And it's exciting to to think of those possibilities and variations because quite often color is thought of like, well, at the end, if we have enough in the budget, we'll do some color. It's like, if right. you bring that in earlier, like <laughs> you can right. really adjust that you can shift the whole the whole production process so that's that's cool I, i'm curious I like to hear to, more about that process from you yeah, from you. I, yeah. I like to i like to talk to those guys i like to challenge the production companies anytime i work with them i say hey look you know think about this you, you're spending how much money on your cameras you're spending how much money on your writing you're spending how much money on on your editorial you're spending all this to keep the content great then you skip the last step where you can optimize the image where right before you send it out so you're just going to skip that 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 probably isn't your best, you know, use case. If you think about it, we're we're there. Colorists are there to optimize that footage for each scene and help. Like I think, like Kevin said, help relight, pull this light down. You know, get rid of that. You know, halo. Get rid of whatever. Um, you know, brighten this up. Can you make this orange? This this gray thing. Make it orange. Give it a little pop. Something um, to then help the the production uh, be seen in a better way. Being reacted to in a better way. Blur this out. Do something to help this moment really, something we couldn't do on set. We didn't have that ability to create it on set. Um, anyway, I like to make, I push them a little bit, the people I work with, just a little bit, just to say, give us more time. Don't, don't, don't expect it to be done in a half day or a day. You know, give us more time and I'll give you options. Uh, we, can, we can explore a little bit and you can choose different things rather than just uh, make it look good. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. So how much does a colorist cost? I know that's like the big question, but. You charge? You guys charge? <laughs> no, <laughs> not in years. All this time. <laughs> what? Oh my God. <laughs> oh no. Oh. I'll jump in. I think there's a, there's a big range. Uh, there's a big yeah, range. I figured um, it would you know, depend um, on the project and what and it is. It's on, it's on your market. Depends on your market. What market are you in? Are you in a big market like the the Silicon Valley? I mean, I I've seen ranges from 500 to 1200. Um, you know, uh, just for you, just for you per day. Um, and that's that's not including studio, or that's not including if you're going to a you know some house or some agency or or whatever. Um, I think freelance. I don't want to quote you guys on your rates, but I mean, it, I've. I've taken everything from, you know, $40 an hour for, you know, for friend rates kind of things and all the way up to 1200, um, you know, plus for, for different, for different projects. That's just for me to be there, uh, you know, within a certain amount of time. But I think that's what changes over time. Yeah, I and, figured and it would depend on project and range and where it is. I'm sorry, I think I cut somebody off there. No. That's that's well, fine. Come no, on, I'm, man. What's your rates? What's your rates? Come on, talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> I know every email. Uh, what's how much rate? do you charge? Oh, yeah. How much what's is your it? Name? <laughs> yeah. yeah. How, know, how much will it cost me to do my movie? Yeah. <laughs> okay. How much does a thirty-second commercial cost? <laughs> right. Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. Of course. Yeah. Well, so, so much. Am I, I coloring like this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, there's always the, you know, people think of it in terms of. Right, so often time, like, oh, it's 30 seconds, it's one minute. But there are so many considerations. And so I always need to see that that cut and like see what it is they're doing. Because I do, as a freelancer, I do quite often charge flat rates if I'm not going in like a day rate situation. And that comes from assessing it, you know, how many clips are they? What condition are they in? Are you shooting from, you know, what you were mentioning, like shooting a different pair of jeans that you're gonna have to rotoscope and like remove or like just isolate, which would take, forever anyway. Um, so there's so many considerations like that, but then also what's the organization? And this is where I think sometimes people think, oh, what, you're gonna charge someone else more for the same job than someone else? And the answer is yeah. yes, but I think <laughs> the big thing is because bigger organizations have a lot more hands in the, what is this, hands in the pie, hands in the whatever. Yeah, the I'm, gonna I'm gonna challenge you on that. I'm gonna oh, challenge you on that. I'm gonna challenge you on that. I'm gonna challenge you on that. I think that you are worth the larger sum and then you give discounts to the lower end to get the work so i don't think you're charging them more you're giving discounts right i i like that i, agree I like with that, that for sure yeah um no exactly you're not trying to rip the people off but there's always that <laughs> amount you have that you know you're worth 
And you're you're right. That's a good way of thinking about it because it is. It's a, you bring it's value. Discount. You bring yeah. value right to the yeah. end that they couldn't put into production. For one hour, how much money you're putting into that piece of content far outweighs your cost. Far, sure. far outweighs your cost. And they don't and, look at it that way. And right. when you don't and, charge okay. them and get your rate up, they take advantage of it and they don't value it. That's why I always promote keep your rates up. Push them up. Let them know. Let them understand. Thousand should be your entry point. And also, there's there's the lack of or the perspective, the level of awareness within what you're working with. Like if you're doing some small indie project, and it's like, okay, I'm just going to be working with the director, maybe producers in the room, okay, or DPs in the room. Okay, cool. That's typically very flexible, and you can make decisions quickly. But then you have large organizations where it's like, you do one round. Oh well, <laughs> that's great. And then Bob from committee. 15 seasons like well actually and so you need to factor that in too so yeah that affects the scale as well like how quickly can you make decisions because that's really and how can you stick to them because that's where i feel like a lot of the you know <laughs> the challenges come yeah kevin you brought up a good point about um knowing what you're getting into with the project and you mentioned like you know uh looking through the footage and oh am i gonna have to rotoscope um, you know, all this stuff, um, you know, just uh, assessing the footage and assessing the project and knowing how much time you're going to have to put into it allows you to um, give producers and directors an idea of, of how much it's going to cost um, and how much, um, you know, you're going to have to invest your time into it. Um, yeah. And I that's think it's, why a, the... it's a great point to, you know, to, to approach every project that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's why the whole, how much does this charge give me a flat rate? It's like, well, I need to know, you know, right, exactly. even talking with the client and getting a good feel for them too. Like it's, it's a collaboration, it's a relationship in addition to just the quick technical thing. That do. Right. I think setting expectations, I think, I think to mm -hmm. encapsulate it, you have to set an expectation. And if they want to do it on a day rate, you set the expectation, then you have this many hours. So here's all the things we're going to do in this session. We're going to look at, we're going to discover, come up with the things you want to have done come up with the things you'd like to have done, right? And I'm going to do all the things that, that have to be done first. I'll get all those things done. And if we have any time left over, then we can do the wants. And, and if that's how we're going to work, otherwise we should work on real time, you know, work on actual, say, here's all, let's do all the exploring that you would like. I'll give you all kinds of different examples. I'll keep them limited, but I'll give you opportunities to make decisions differently. Give you suggestions. Do you want my suggestions? Do you want my help? Or do you just want me to do what you want me to do? and really get that expectation out there and so they understand you're there to help or you're just there to push a button because we're we can do either one <laughs> we can do either one of those works and each one costs a different amount of money and each one takes a little bit of different skills and i think i think producers and directors actually appreciate that when they realize they can actually ask you and they understand that you're there for them and they understand you're trying to get the most out of it and when you give them questions like what did you mean by this shot what did you mean here you know, who, where is the, where is the eye, where is the eye supposed to be right now? You know, where's the heart of the scene? You know, is it here? Is this at the Dolby logo? Is it, you know, this mouse? You know, where is the heart of the scene? Is it this? I need to be able to focus the eye on that. And then when I start to push on that and do the things that I do to really pull that thing out, they start to see a value. And, and then that, that value of that piece of content goes up. And then you got to talk to them on the, like a postmortem and say, look, did I bring value to you? You know, how much would that have cost you in production? This is why I think our next project, we should jump the rates up a little bit and have those kind of conversations. Well Wonder said, Shane. Well said. <laughs> yes, well said. I have one more yeah. question that I have before I want to jump into the questions from our audience today. So how should I prepare for a color session? So what do you guys do to prepare for your sessions? <laughs> Who wants it? Uh, <laughs> Evan, Evan, how do you want people to, to make your, uh, to pr prepare for you? Like coming up, let's say you're not the editor. Let's say you're just the colorist. Um, sure. How do you want that? How do you want them to prepare you, prepare a shot for you or a set for you? Um, well, I think we touched a little bit on it just a moment ago when we talked about, um, you know, uh, assessing the project and, uh, um, you know, looking over the footage and knowing what you're getting into and setting expectations. Um, but from a more technical standpoint, I mean, you know, I want, I want um, raw files as much as possible. Uh, if that uh, is not possible, I want, I want the uh, video 
clean without any graphics um, and just ready for, for me to jump in and, and start my work. Um, yeah. Yeah, okay. Typically it's, yeah, <laughs> we'll all have our, our different ways of going on it. Um, typically what I'll do is lay out what you're saying Shane about expectations, like lay out, this is the workflow, this is the process, make it very clear what I need each step. So, and then the timelines so that they, they know. And so in, in terms of where you actually are, first things first, you, I would get the footage. I would, I would look at it that we talk, I talk with the director about, you know, what kind of feel they're going for, break it down by scene or moment and get a really clear idea. And then uh, obviously you have to get the footage and the director has to prepare those files, get those over if you're working remotely. Um, and then I'd like to come up with some hero images for each scene for the, and then test the waters, right? Like find out, you know, yeah. if it's in person, get them, you know, let's let's have a session, like go through this, get this done. If it's worked remotely, send those over to wherever they are and and really get a feel for, is this is this good? Do you want it more stylized, less stylized, more contrasty, more saturated, less, you know, get a really good feel. And then once we can lock that down, then I'll go to work on the first, the first draft, the first pass. Um, and really lay those that style into the whole piece, um, putting it together so that it can be adjusted relatively quickly if it needs to be, and then send that over for approval. And depending on what you build into the contract, a certain number of revisions and what have you. Um, and then typically I'll click into hourly if it's a flat rate project or whatever. Um, but generally I like to start where the whole process is very clear up front and then work in increments instead of, you know, yes, I made it perfect for you on the first pass. Yes. And then right. No, right. 15 hours. So uh, right. I find that that works pretty well if they're all on board right up front. And then, then it's easy with the editor because, you know, you work, you can go back and forth on what the technical stuff is, but that still takes so little time, especially if you work with editors who are used to, used to churning out the files you need. Yeah, totally. I, I like the idea of, you know, establishing that workflow and, and that's part of defining because sometimes you you get a one-off client or you're a brand new client um, and they have no idea how you work. You have no idea how they think. You don't know what language they use, you know, trying to have a conversation with them outside of the actual, you know, scheduling, that kind of thing is always helpful or talk to other people about how they work um, is, is can, can be a useful, it's sometimes more challenging and, and depending on the kind of work that you do. Um, but establishing that rapport and that understanding of when I say hotter, what does that mean? When I say brighter, make it more punchy, what does that mean to you? You know, define that. Being able to talk to the, the person is really, I think we're interpreters. That's part of what colorists do is we interpret the emotional uh, or the words that are coming out of someone's mouth to figure out how we're going to push that in luminance and, and chrominance, right? Like, what does that mean? Okay, I, got, I think I got, was this what you mean? Okay. Um, and having that understanding early, because then as you do more projects with that person, um, it becomes much easier. You, you know, you've established a workflow and then if something changes, it's easier to talk about those changes because you've already have an established workflow. You already have an established, we're gonna do this. I personally like having uh, either uh, an idea. Um, I've given um, first time people that come to me will get a lot of times a, a request to say, okay, please break down each scene and pull images from the web. If you don't have them with you, just pull them from the web. Tell me what you're, you were thinking. Tell me what you imagine this to look like um, because that'll give me an idea of where you're going. And then as we start to work on it, be ready to have those thrown out because, <laughs> right? And, and set that expectation because they, they know as they start to work through it, um, they have an idea of what works, but it may not be the actually idea that they end up wanting when you show them, okay, that really, doesn't work yeah it's cool it's teal and blue you know <laughs> but it's or teal and orange you know but that's not really the that doesn't make me feel good about this moment uh let me show you and then then that that it, they have an expectation it's really a conversation i think right and what you were saying about context earlier shane you know you may think hey i want it to look like this crazy you know or whatever you want and then you mm. see two things you wanted next to each other and you go hmm yeah. So how do we yeah. transition mm. that and, or what do you abandon where? Yeah. So it's seeing that all in the moment is, is powerful. And then being able to be responsible to that client and say, look, this is going to take more time. Mm -hmm. Just it's going to take, I know I told you this amount of time, but that was when we, we weren't talking like this. 
and, and being able to just honestly be up to him and say, look, if you want to continue down this line, I'm going to have to charge you more and not worry about that, whoa, you know, kind of that, that pushback. Uh, and that's really hard for, for, I think the younger, uh, not say younger, the, um, the newer colorists who, you know, need every job, who want every job, who, you know, who, who need those things, um, being able to say no, or being able to just say, look, I'm going to have to charge you more if we do this. Uh, and, and just having the wherewithal to understand that the changes you're making are costing time and, and you're not going to be able to get everything done. Don't over promise, you know, under promise, over deliver. <laughs> That's a good, yeah. <laughs> Never the other way around. Yes. Um, so I'm going to jump into some of the audience questions now. And everybody, thank you for bearing with me today as I do this from my phone. Uh, my computer would not work. So, okay. Robin. Oh, hi, Robin. I'm glad you're watching. Robin Kincaid says, <laughs> okay, fast, cheap, or good? Pick two. <laughs> Come on, Evan. You, it's uh, yours, man. <laughs> fast and good. <laughs> Cheap, good. Yeah, I, you know. I don't want to go cheap. I mean, actually, uh, if it's cheap, I'll go any two personally. Uh, I don't mind any of those because if it's cheap right. and, and good, okay. If it's fast and cheap, okay, it's fast. I didn't waste a lot of time. I think any of those two, um, I, I, it, it's a magic question and Robin, I'll get you for this one. That's a, that's a good one. Yeah, <laughs> right, if you can, if you can exactly. nail two of them, it's a success, you know? <laughs> and they're almost antithetical to each other sometimes too because you, you can can't only have, have something be <laughs> right it's like if it has to be really fast it's going to be really hard to make that cheap if it's going to be good it's going to be hard to make yeah exactly yeah trick yeah. questions yeah you yeah, can yeah. only get two you only get two so uh yeah uh, any of them <laughs> all right so let's see um do you have any stories where you went to view a project you colored like at a premiere or something and it looked terrible <laughs> Oh. Terrible? No. I not terrible. Uh, different. I would say different. Absolutely. But not terrible. Yeah. I, I've yeah. had an experience doing something for a projection. I won't say where it was happening, um, but we colored and we, we did it on a calibrated projection um, <laughs> and it looked really good. Uh, and then when they brought it to the place that was actually going to be played, when they played it, they saw how old the bulb was immediately. They saw how out of whack the colors were immediately. And uh, luckily there was someone there who could actually do a little bit in the color profiles of the projector to, to push some stuff up because they were not happy. Um, but it got to a fix <laughs> to some along. <laughs> yeah, the, pro the projectors, I've had good luck with, with projector movie, thank God. I know, like there's always something rating. Um, but I definitely have had, you know, that's one of the things with coloring is that people are going to be viewing it on any, so many different monitors and TV, depending on what, you know, phones and you get a client that comes back and is like, oh, it looked great on this device and this other device, it looked different. And it's like, that's just sort of how it works. And I totally understand that I've had the same effect. Um, but I think we're the one thing that we do have in our control more than anything, especially with something that's not going to be played in a really professional situ uh, setting is just that everything looks relatively good to it, good to itself. So like everything matches. It may, the whole thing may shift as you view it on a different display, but it will still, it's everything all. will work within the world. That's like what we have in our control uh, once right. you let it out into the world. It's relative, yeah. yeah, it's relative, yeah, a relative it's, change. Yeah. yeah. All right, let's see our next question we have is from James. James asks, how do you see yourselves working with a camera shader? Um, we actually do, I have. Um, we're part and parcel with those guys. I mean, basically we're just an extension of them, especially if you're talking on a live scenario. So if they're live and they're recording, that's what a shader is, is for live content. Um, once that we can see where they're going and if we understand what the director was given them as far as directions was given those, those people who are doing the shading, then once we get that footage for some post, you know, offline, because obviously it's a live, they're doing live shading. They give me us, give us that footage. We do something offline. Um, <clears throat> then we can see what they're after. And, uh, or we can even call them and talk to them if it's, if the, if the director is not there or the person in charge of the image isn't there. 
it's it's basically hand in hand um, because they're doing what we're doing. They're just doing it live. Does anyone else have anything to add or I can move no on? No experience to working with them, no. Uh, yeah, the, li the live sector <clears throat> is not where I roll with Colin now. So nope. Shame. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, my, yeah. my next question is, have you ever had a project that seemed like it was close to done and then someone else came in and everything changed? I have a term for that. <laughs> Moving a train Ooh. sideways. Oh, nice. That's Ooh. good. And just as painful too. I like that. Yeah. That's uh, I'm I'll I'll back off on the answer because yeah, but <laughs> not sure, I think we've all had that experience. Yeah. We've all had that experience. Yeah. It's kind of the nature yeah. of the business, right? Yeah. I mean it, it happens. Yeah. You get you just gotta roll with it, you know, you gotta take it in stride and uh, just make it make it hap make the client happy in the end. Make it happen. Yeah, giving them giving them realistic expectations of what the change that right. they're requesting is happening, and, and I think that's the responsibility of a colorist. That's the responsibility to the producer. Say, hey, and if the directors keep pushing on it, and and you have the ability of communicating with the producer, you can tell them, look, they're they're asking me for the impossible. I want to do it, but they're asking me for the impossible with this time frame, with this budget, and how do you want to proceed? Either I tell them no, I personally don't want to tell them no but I can tell them that the budget won't allow that. Um, but can we all sit down and have a conversation about that? Because this, this isn't going, the last thing you want is there, as a client that comes in and changes direction and expects by the conversations and the things that you've had that it's okay and that you don't say anything about it because then you're just coloring with a, you know, a burr on your back or something, you know, like a, you're just uh -huh. like, mm, I didn't, it's my own fault for not saying something. I didn't set this up well. And, you know, you're, you have to just swallow and, you know, do the job. Um, if you didn't set it up right, it's your own fault when, when you go over time, um, if you didn't set the expectation. That makes sense. Uh, and we have time for one more question from our audience and it is from Andrew, I believe, and he, he asks, what would you say to a producer that says their film does not need post-color grading, they, that they like how it looks? Okay. Great. Yeah. <laughs> um, if they're in charge of the image, right? Yeah. yeah. If you're happy with it, then you're happy with it, you know? I might say, do you want to show you a couple what we could do with it? <laughs> <laughs> you know, want to do a day of discovery? One day, it's all going to cost you. You know, if you don't like it, okay. That's a great approach. Yeah. Has that happened? Has that happened and worked? Shane, no, are you? Was, go ahead. Oh no, some something. I'm sure you guys. Well, maybe maybe you don't, but uh, encounter. But is the when people work with some footage for such a long time, and if they don't use a lot, or, or, or even if they do like, just are used to looking in Rec 709, they're, they're mm -hmm. look, used to looking at the flat footage, and then they come in and they say, I want it to be like this. Mm -hmm. And you're like, but but that, that's just because their eyes, their, their psyches are used to that as being the film. And so sometimes it's, it's harder to show the options and, and be like, well, let's, you know, have the open mind, let's try this, this, and this, because you find that no matter what you do, you keep veering back to sort of what it looked like when they were editing it, if they spend a long time with the footage. So that's probably the closest thing I've had to that, because otherwise they just wouldn't seek you out, I suppose. Yeah. 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 Evan, awesome. come on. Yeah, I, 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 I noticed, saw a story, I man. A I saw a story. <laughs> I, well, I, I was thinking, I noticed a trend um, when, when, you know, flat camera profiles started coming out that clients would yeah. come in and they like like you were saying, Kevin. They were you know kind of gravitate back towards that flat look because they were just the image was burned into their minds. Um, and I don't know if you guys have no, noticed that trend as well, but you know I I, I remember it, and I you know we we would have to um, you know show show the client what we can do and show them you know this is what good color grading can look like and this is what we can bring to your project and add you know emotionally to the story yeah yeah i think that's one of the challenging things is when someone gets married to that image profile or that you know that gamut profile um 
it's it's a, an easy way, not an easy way, but a, a way of getting them through that is to to sit down and talk with them about what they're trying to get out of each scene. Try to get them through examples, especially if you're already on the books and you've got to do something. You know, giving them you know giving them some options and and maybe you know trying to find a way of saying, I what do you like about this? Like, what do you like about this flat profile? Is it the last less saturation? Is it how the, you know, everything in the darks are, are able to be seen? You know, try to get an understanding and start working on them and saying, so if you like this part of it, you like to see everything, what if we, you know, let everything on the bottom end be there, but then take up the top end and then maybe deset so that you get a little bit of color punch. Would a color punch feel good? Let me show you what that looks like. And, and you slowly work them through the situation, but not just for looks, but also with the idea of what are you trying to say? You know, where are you trying to look? You know, because you could just do a massive color correction uh, job in for that versus a color grading, and maybe you're just in there fixing things, blurring, creating depth, um, you know, shadows, light, and just working on that side where they like the color profiles, they like that muted color style, and that's not a problem. You know, there's a, still a lot of work you can do as a colorist inside a project that doesn't require you to push and pull on the colors necessarily. Very cool. I was muted there, but I am back to say thank you so much to our panelists tonight. This was truly a topic I did not know a lot about. And so this was really interesting and very informative. And um, I got a lot out of it. Thank you guys so much. Um, and if you would just want to go ahead and just say your names and like your social, if you have a website or something you'd like to promote, you can go ahead and do that right now for everybody watching. I'm looking at the top left corner, but maybe that's not oh. the same. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm Kevin Barber um, on social. I'm Kevin Barber XYZ on most platforms. And same thing, Kevin Barber XYZ on website as well. Great. And I'm Evan Schaefer, and my website is postbyevan.com. Cool. Nice. Uh, my name is Shane Mario Ruggieri. You can find me at shanemario.com. Um, S-H-A-N-E-M-A-R-I-O. Great. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you guys. And again, I'm Sarah Marintz and I'm at sarahmarintz.com. And once again, this has been an awesome crew talk brought to you by Shoot Stop Video. And you can find us on our YouTube channel. So go ahead and check that out. And we will see you for our next episode in two weeks. Thank you guys. Have a great 4th of July weekend. Thanks Bye, everyone. Bye. You might be looking at Shoot Stop Video and thinking, so how does this all work? Is this about A, setting up the whole crew for me, B, just giving me options and having me handle it, or C, something in between? Well, it's D, all of the above. To put it simply, we're here to help you in any way that we can to get the crew and talent you need for your next production. We believe that every level of video production can benefit from a well-maintained list of qualified crew members for every position. This goes for pre-pro, on set, and for post. Every project is different, so if you need a producer to help manage the decision-making process, then we can totally do that. If you're already a producer and want to build your own crew from scratch, then go for it. We're here to make your next production a success. And if you are crew or talent looking for producers that want you, then you've come to the right place. Sign up now, and also leave a referral for any solid people that you know that are already on here. Thank you for considering Shoot Stop Video, and happy shooting!